Nora is a digital creator in the British Library's digital research team. Her work centers on digital and data science skill development for cultural heritage professionals, with a particular emphasis on the innovative application of new technologies in the curation and cataloging of heritage collections. Since its exception, inception sorry, in 2012, she has managed the design and delivery of the library's groundbreaking digital scholarship training program. This bespoke program helps to ensure that the library's staff can support emerging areas of modern scholarship in our computationally driven world. Nora speaks widely on the value of investing in staff digital skills in the cultural heritage sector, providing practical guidance to cultural institutions around the world and offering advice on ways to implement in-house digital upskilling. Thank you, Nora. So that was really exciting seeing everybody say where they're from in the chat. What a good group today <laughs> from all over. Um, and some names I really recognize um, and some institutions for sure. I think there are people from the British Library, which is exciting. Um, and so I wanted to say while you're talking and if you have um, kind of eureka moments and say, oh, I've learned about um, a project at my institution that does something similar or this sort of thing, do share in the chat with other people. So this is, you know, it's not just me talking to all of you, but if there's knowledge that you want to share, um, please, let's do it. We'll do it all together. Um, so I'll kick off with, um, this is an intro to AI and machine learning in libraries, but it's a very short time. Uh, so I do a much longer workshop that I had written with some colleagues in the Smithsonian um, and the National Archives UK um, for the library carpentry workshop. And that one is, you know, a half a day to a day to, to give to people. Um, but we'll do what we can in the short time that we have today. Um, and hopefully there will be time for questions afterwards. And of course, this whole series is going to be absolutely awesome for everybody kind of getting a foundation and more in-depth um, information about this kind of area and its relevance to us um, in libraries. So let me go forward. So um, by the end of this talk, I hope you'll be well on your way to being able to explain and differentiate some of the key terms. So we'll do a lot of kind of jargon busting um, and be able to kind of describe ways in which AI is being used in the cultural heritage context. And like I said with the chat, you know, there it's really hard <laughs> to pick. <laughs> because there's a lot of AI and machine learning happening in um, our sector. So it's really hard to get all those case studies out there. Um, so I've only selected a, a few that I thought were kind of illustrative of the sorts of things we can do. But if you have others, do share them um, so that we can all start getting an idea of all the, the extent of things that are going on. Um, we'll talk about identifying what kinds of tasks that machine learning models are really good at and whether or not you even need them for certain things. Um, and hopefully at the end, we'll have some time to reflect on the ethical implications of applying machine learning. Um, and we'll discuss kind of briefly some very high level things that we can start to think about um, and places to go to get more information when we're, we're um, thinking about AI ethics. So uh, possibly a lot of you will be happy to know that uh, none of this will require knowledge of coding, statistics, or math. So you can all breathe easy <laughs> now. This is quite high level, but I hope it'll be interesting and uh, illuminating. So uh, just like in the workshop that we give, we like to start with some jargon busting. And I'm going to add in a little bit of hype busting as well today, because I think a lot of us um, are getting wrapped up in the whole chat GPT and such like the excitement around it. But there's a lot of um, worries. So I hope today that I will dispel some of that worry for some of us. There are things that we should be looking out for with the use of AI and machine learning, but there's also some things we can put on the back burner of our worry list <laughs> for the time being. Um, so this is funny. I did try and get um, a generative AI, and I'll explain that term later, 
uh, to create an image for me for my slides um, of a red haired woman teaching a room full of librarians about machine learning. And it has made you all gingers. So welcome to the club. <laughs> Um, so artificial intelligence is really a broad field of computer science. Um, this is how you can think of it. And it's an umbrella term that refers to the research and development of systems and machines capable of doing tasks that typically require human intelligence to perform. So it's like reasoning, problem solving, you know, systems that can learn, have some sort of perception. Um, and it's important to think of this, uh, you know, I kind of want to highlight the bit about tasks and focus on, tip, you know, typically requiring human intelligence. And I think where things go a little haywire is people start to talk about AI in terms of it having intelligence. And um, this is where all this kind of fear mongering comes from, but it's also from our own kind of human nature. You know, I don't know how many of you have um, like me, thanked Alexa <laughs> for giving the daily weather report, whether it was right or wrong. You know, we're quite polite <laughs> with all of these systems that are AI generated that we are kind of conversing with. And that's perfectly natural. And the other thing that's happening is that these AI systems are getting quite good. It's mimicry, but it's really convincing but there isn't sentience behind what's happening. And as we kind of explore what machine learning is and how it works, you'll, it'll become clear. But we can be easily kind of fooled here. You know, even a Google engineer, this, I find that story so sad for this, this poor guy who was convinced that this large language model, and I'll explain those in a bit, you know, had become sentient. So large language models are behind things like chat GPT. And he, you know, he really thought, oh my God, I'm talking to a real, a real entity. Um, but as we understand, as, as you and, and I go through, you know, what large language models is, you, you come to understand that that's not what it had been. So right now we have really good algorithms and models. They're performing very specific and discrete functions that we're laying out for them. And we call that weak AI. Now, when people wanna start talking about sentience and the space age stuff, that is called strong AI. And that's actually artificial general intelligence. So that's when, and it's really just a theory, right? This is not happening. It's not what, what the state of the art is right now. Um, and it may never be. Um, but that would be the ability to really understand these computer programs. They're understanding, they have knowledge, so they're actually learning things. And importantly, across a wide range of tasks. So, you know, the robot that can play chess is also driving the car, is also, you know, having the conversation, is, is a, you know, when we think of our own intelligence, it's across many domains and many tasks and, and that sort of thing. So we are a very, <laughs> long way. So don't worry about that. I'll tell you later things that you can worry about <laughs> more legitimate, legitimately right now. Um, so depending on who you ask, there are 3 billion subfields of AI, or there are like six. So we won't worry about that too much. Um, all you need to know today is that there are subfields. Um, many of the things you may have already heard from, heard about are tend to be subfields of AI. And all of them though are really interconnected. So the subfields really focus on a certain part of AI. So building um, systems that are somewhat autonomous um, and can do prediction and that sort of thing. Um, and some of them underpin all the other work, all the other subfields. So for instance, machine learning is a subfield and the core technologies there um, are underpinning all the other ones. So machine learning, and I'll go into all of these. So, well, I will go into machine learning, natural language processing, and computer vision today, because we don't have time to cover absolutely everything. Um, and those are the areas that will really set you on the path of kind of understanding how we have machine learning in our area, in the library world. 
Um, so machine learning is the kind of fundamental thing across all of AI research, and that's just developing algorithms that can learn and make predictions on new data. And then we have NLP, as it's shortened to, natural language processing, and that's looking at making AI systems that are capable of, you know, natural and effective interaction with humans. So that's text and speech. Um, and computer vision is sort of the eyes of the AI, right? It's it's it concerned with getting enabling machines to be able to interpret and make decisions based on visual data from the world. So that's you know images, that is videos, this sort of thing. So you can start to understand why we have a cer certainly a huge amount of text of speech in our library collections, and we have a huge amount of visual data. And if these are subfields that are learning to parse that information and understand more from that information, then of course we're gonna we're gonna benefit from that. So before I go into those a little deeper, you may have also heard these terms of well, certainly I'm sure you've heard of generative AI, and then you may in the same breath have heard of traditional AI. Um, so it's sort of a loose thing, but if you do hear it, traditional AI is really talking about tasks like classifying data. It's very much about using as a tool to do things. So for us, it's things like putting labels to images. You know, this is a cat. This is an image of a cat, um, or transcribing text, or, or doing an action a kind of task. Um, and then generative AI refers to any kind of systems whose primary function is to create stuff, so generate new content. So that content could be conversation, it could be books, it can be art. So we look at, like, this just came out the other day. I thought it was really funny. Katy Perry singer um, was not at the Met Gala, but she used a little generative AI functionality, you know, which this is showing up in many kinds of image um, uh, making software. Very easy. My son can use it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's right there um, to create sort of new pictures based on text that you give it. And uh, she put it out on Instagram and her mom was like, oh, so beautiful. I didn't know that you were at the Mecca. So, you know, it could be quite uh, convincing. <laughs> and I also threw in here, so I have links in here for after. Um, I hope I hope everyone may have access to these slides afterwards so that um, you can check out some of the links. And, and this is just an interesting one about, you know, there's a lot of these, but little tests about can you tell if something is an AI um, generated image. Now with the generative AI stuff, it's a little bit more exploratory for us. So we're only just now kind of exploring some of the big potential applications for content generation. Certainly there's some impact already on our library work, which I'll cover when I just briefly talk about large language models and chat GPT later. But use cases are are still developing. So if you do have use cases, if you're on the call and you do have some, please do share. I would love to, to collect that. Now, uh, we'll cover machine learning straight away because it's kind of the basis of everything we're kind of doing here. So it's important to keep in mind that primary task of machine learning is prediction. And you will be quizzed about this. So remember this. <laughs> Um, but if we want to go back, let's think about computers, how they work. Um, an algorithm is essentially a plan. It's a set of step-by-step -step instructions. Um, it has to be in the order of operation, and it's for solving a problem or performing a task. So my son in his school, you know, they learn about algorithms now. He's just a wee, wee lad. Um, but, you know, they start out by saying, well, how would you instruct somebody to make a sandwich? And it's always quite funny because you really do have to think about all the steps and they have to be in the right order or you have a very bizarre sandwich that is just like laying on top of a, on a table um, with no bread because you forgot about the bread. Um, it's the same thing with a computer. So an algorithm is we want to tell a computer to do something. We have to write a computer program that will tell it step by step exactly what we want it to do and how we want to do it. 
but you may hear about machine learning algorithms. So a machine algorithm is still a special kind of algorithm, but it's designed to help computers to learn from data. So that's the kind of difference there. So instead of giving the computer explicit instructions for every task, we focus on giving it data. Um, and, and sometimes we're giving it training data. So training data would be like, you know, we are marking it up. We're saying this, these are the facts of this data, learn something from it. I'll explain that in a second. Um, and we let it find patterns and relationships and trends in that data in order for it to then make decisions or predictions on new data on its own. So when you hear someone talking about training a model, and I work with a lot of data scientists and they're always training a model. <laughs> that is essentially a, the process of teaching a machine learning algorithm to make these predictions or decisions based on the data. So you, data, data, data. <laughs> that is the kind of fundamental thing in machine learning is the lifeblood. And your model really is only as good as the type and quality of data that you give it. So I have put in these two examples here of some of the projects and experiments at the British Library involving machine learning. And I hope that when you are able, if you have time and you're able to have a, a read of these um, after this talk, um, it will be a little more illuminated as to what they're talking about. But um, in the first example, this was a project to look at our digitized 19th century British Library books and see if we could train, um, create a model that would be able to, to look at the genre of those books. So a lot of these have very poor catalog records associated with them. We're talking about thousands of texts that have been digitized. Um, the quality may, may not be up to par. We don't know if they are fiction or nonfiction. Um, so this was something that they focused on. So they thought, well, let's try this. We're going to do fiction or nonfiction. Is this book fiction? Is it not fiction? And when we're talking about data, we have to give the algorithm examples of something that is fiction and something that is definitely nonfiction. So that's our training data. Um, We'll stick with that for now. There are other other um, machine learning models that are built without this kind of training data. But for today, let's focus on this kind of example. So they needed to, as a project, make a, a decision as to what the data would be that they're going to show the, the algorithm to create the model. So they could do the full text. They could do maybe just the existing catalog record information maybe just the titles, they could do the title page. So in the end, they did the title page um, of each text. And so they, they showed the algorithm, lots and lots of title pages of something and said, these are fiction, this is nonfiction, and then trained a model to be able to look at new pages that had never seen before and guess and have a, a, a prediction about what they thought it might be. Is it fiction or nonfiction? Um, and again, this other one was around, you know, using machine learning to automate language identification. So again, we have all these digitized books and they don't have language associated with them. <laughs> so it's the same, a similar kind of, of process there. Um, so you can see how the data is interesting. So why didn't they do the full text? There will be reasons for that. Why did they do the title page? There will be reasons for that. And there will be, you know, uh, that will impact how well the model works. And I remember they were presenting this to staff as well. And I remember people from other, with other language expertise were like, well, in like, I think it was Russian. It's interesting because the title pages are quite different. So fiction would be very long title. So it's it, you do need that expertise when you're building these models and collecting your data to make sure that you you have the right training data sets that um, to get the result that you want because we're not all the same, <laughs> right? And and having that diversity of knowledge, especially with different language materials, is super important. So a lot of decisions are made. It's not just magic, and it's the model is dependent on our knowledge and what we put into it. 
So what is a machine learning model? I've said this a million times, but haven't um, defined it. So the machine learning model is what it represents what um, the machine learning algorithm has learned essentially. So it's an output. So you end up with a model. It's a series of information, it's rules, it's numbers, it's all the data structures that the algorithm has created to say, okay, this is what I think is required to make predictions on new data. So that's your model. And the model is then used um, on new data. So you throw new stuff at the model. So new title pages from books that, you know, the, the um, model has never seen before and see how fair, fair you know, how well it fares. Um, and you can go back and you can work on that model. You can give it more data. You can tweak its parameters until it's, at a point of accuracy that you feel comfortable with. So it's another part of the process to think about um, where do you draw the line? Um, so this is, I love this, this little image that was created by um, my buddy at Smithsonian. Uh, and he was talking about the stages of a machine learning project. And, you know, it's so simple. You just define the business need. You create your project team. You gather the data. Uh, you define the metric. You create a baseline. You know, what, what's, what are our, what are we going to be ha happy with in terms of the output? So I'm happy if 50% of the title pages um, are somewhat accurate. I'm not 90%. It has to be, you know, that sort of thing. Um, are you going to use an existing model? Are you going to create one? Are you going to generate results or prediction? And then you you look at your results. Well, the reality of machine learning project is a little more complex than that. Uh, you'll go back. I mean, you could be stopped right at the gathering data part, right? So you look at your data and you're like, this is the wrong data. This will not give us what we want, or we need to create new data. Um, we need to create the training data that's going to need people and crowdsourcing. We're going to need these things. So we go back to creating a project team, hire more people. So it goes all over the place. I'm, I'm afraid I have to tell you <laughs> it's not so straightforward and simple, but if you're armed with that knowledge, it should be okay. <laughs> So I don't have, um, I can't do it interactively today because we don't have the time, but this is part of what we do um, at uh, another, when we do the workshop full on. But um, I'll just give you the answer. So if you're in our workshop, I'm always going to know. But remember what I said about machine learning is prediction. So, um, and that's the opposite from just telling a computer step by step, the things that you do, you know, if something happens, do this. So we do this kind of list of what are the, you know, which of the following do you think would need machine learning? And if you get a copy of these slides, you can go through these a little in more detail. But you see things like counting the number of people in a museum using information from entry and exit barriers. Does that really need any prediction? No, you know, you just give it, you know, some, some rules so you can you can just program an algorithm to, you know, simply and easily um, do this kind of work. So as, again, with a queuing system that spreads people evenly, you just, it just spreads people evenly, it's fine. Um, but imagine trying to have a search system that um, you upload an image to, and then it's trying to find images that are similar. I mean, it would like boggle the mind to even think of how one might do that without the machine being able to do that for us. So um, these are the sort of examples of why you would need machine learning. So some tasks that we can have machine learning do for us in libraries, and I write it that way because I just want to keep reiterating that this isn't like magic stuff. We are involved in this. We are choosing the data. We are making decisions. Machine learning is a tool for us in libraries. It's not something... Um, I don't know, I think people think it's like magic, but there's a lot of work and a lot um, behind these things. And you do have a, a can exert a certain amount of control in machine learning projects as you develop them. But it's just nice to think of it as a tool to help us, right? 
So um, really quickly about natural language processing. Again, that whole field of study develops algorithms and models for understanding, analyzing, extracting meaningful information from text and speech data. So of course we have a ton of that. Um, so I'm sure that uh, plenty of you have probably seen something like this. this is a really simple example um, of natural language processing tools. Um, that could be helpful to us in libraries and already is, right? So NER, you know, text analysis, it looks at unstructured text and it makes it structured. And by that, I mean, it's taking, um, it's turning these kinds of text strings or a chunk of text or a sentence into categories of information, which can then be, you know, united with other things. It can help us um, improve our catalog records, that sort of thing. So this is a pretty common um, and sort of hopefully just a simple um, uh, sort of example to, to show you the sort of uh, possibilities here. Um, now, another sort of jargon busting thing today is large language models. So I'm sure everybody's heard a lot of this. So this is um, in NLP. Now, language models, and it's really important to, to understand what language models are meant to do. So it's a type of machine learning model, very much used in NLP. Um, and its main thing, it's designed to predict the likelihood of a sequence of text. So it means that it can be set up to predict the most likely way to continue a conversation. But this is just one use of language models. So a large language model is one of massive scale and is quite complex. So when we talk about things like ChatGPT, ChatGPT behind that is um, our large language models. So ChatGPT is just the interface to, um, you know, so you can type into ChatGPT your question, your prompt. Um, and it's called a prompt because you're, you are, that is data itself. So you're prompting it in conversation. So you're prompting a conversation with the chat, with um, the large language model, essentially. And it's been exposed to an enormous amount of text from books. You can, um, it leverages neural networks and deep learning techniques. So it knows a bit about the complexity of human language. Um, this is very much in the generative AI realm, right? So, but when you're asking a question of chat GPT, you are presenting the model with new information and it's trying to make a prediction on that information. And the prediction is just trying to generate the most appropriate response that matches the pattern of conversation you're starting with it. Um, so, you know, what ChatGPT is not. And so this is my sort of public service announcement <laughs> because it's happening a lot where I think, you know, people think it's like a big Google search box or, these large language models, they know things, they know things, they're like crunching the information out on the web and they're creating, you know, a, a learned response to things because the conversation is so convincing, but that is not what's behind it. It's not how it's working. And so we have had researchers, you know, contacting, contacting curators at the library with, um, you know, trying to find articles, trying to find, you know, things they asked of ChatGPT, you know, what's what's the recent um, literature on the French Revolution? I don't know, pulling that out. Uh, and it's getting like a list of um, references to articles. And then people write the libraries, I can't find this article. The article is fake, you know, because ChatGPT, the large language model, is simply trying to have a conversation with you. They're not intelligent. It doesn't know. <laughs> You know, so the, this is the kind of impact that we're seeing in the libraries. Um, it's more that it's the use of, it's other people's use of these things um, impacting us as we're fielding calls and fielding information that's generated from ChatGPT. It is really con convincing, I will tell you. And it is also a useful tool, but it's more of a tool for, you know, tidying up writing or, or, you know, if you need help for a more accessible title or ideas for new exhibition titles, it can 
give you these sorts of ideas. It's a real idea generating kind of thing to kind of spur on your own own writing um, at the moment. So I put these because we don't have time today, but there are a couple of the most recent sort of um, readings and musings on ChatGPT and people exploring some of the the um, use cases of this. And I, maybe there will be another um, a more in depth talk on this another time. I'm not sure um, through RLE UK, but it's it's quite you know it's quite new days, and a lot of people are using it in ways that like other other things that already exist are actually better at doing than a, using a large language model of chat GPT for this. So, but it's good. People are asking questions and having a play. And I think everyone here who haven't used chat GPT, definitely do it. It's free um, and give it a go so that you understand how it works. Um, it, it won't hurt you, I promise. And it's not real, just keep that in mind. <laughs> Okay, so um, on to computer vision. So uh, that's involving development of algorithms for automatically extracting and analyzing information that's in our images and videos. And so this is a real, we, we are very much involved in using this um, as a kind of use case. So if you look here very quickly, um, you can use computer vision for automatically um, uh, classifying whether or not digitized pages are from a newspaper, from which newspaper, um, does it have images? So they've used computer vision here and trained it on New York Tribune um, newspapers and all sorts of different newspapers. And the probability is quite high that that was a newspaper because it recognized, you know, the nameplate recognize that it's a that it has a headline understand the kind of objects in a page that that looks like a news newspaper um and then like i was saying in the wider field of ai all of these subfields and what they come up with can kind of be brought together um into one uh um one kind of machine learning project. So they buy and steal from each other and um, can be plugged in to do different parts of the machine learning project. So um, I do hope I have some links in here as well. Um, one of my absolute favorite projects of all time is Transcribus. I'm sure you folks have heard about that by now. Uh, and Transcribus is so very clever and um, has, you know, put it all together with machine learning, computer vision, and natural language processing, right? So um, it's probably one of the most state-of-the-art applications we see right now in cultural heritage, um, and one of the most useful, so handwritten text recognition, of course. So this interface here is showing one of our projects around the automatic um, transcription of some of our Arabic manuscripts. And you can see here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, we have created the training data set. So we load the images into there. We define what all the regions are and the objects. So this is a sentence. It should be read right to left. This is what it's saying. You know, these are the individual letters. This is the line break, this sort of thing. And all of that information, so you do this, uh, um, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of, of pages. You could do it as a crowdsourcing thing. You could do it just internally, curatorial stuff. And you define what the truth is. So they call it ground truth, what the truth is of that page. So this represents everything on this page. This is what it is. And then you transcribe this, allow allows you to train your own model for that. So the algorithm looks at all the ground truth that you've you've given it um, and then will create a model just for you. But all the models can be shared as well. So there's a link here on the public AI model. So they can be made public. So you could use, if you have a very similar um, handwriting, you could use another model that someone else has already created. And it might do actually quite well, depending on what are the pages that you handwritten, um, what your handwriting um, pages look like. So the interesting thing is, you know, they use a lot of computer vision models that, you know, try and identify 
letters based on the shapes. And then you might have a model um, that's looking at what the word is based on those shapes. But then and when you think about handwriting, sometimes things are smudged out or it's really hard to read a word. Um, so you can then use natural language processing to look at um, where things are in a sentence. So to predict sentence level, um, I think the next word that we're missing here is probably this one. So you're combining all this stuff um, and it's very exciting. So I'm just conscious of time. So I'm going to quickly go through this in case people have more questions. Not to denigrate AI and ethics, we could be doing this for hours. <laughs> um, but just to give you a, a simple sense, I sort of covered it when we were talking about data earlier. Um, but it's this idea that people seem to sometimes think, oh, these systems are omniscient, they're they know something that we don't know. You know, they don't have human proclivities. They're just facts and numbers. Um, but we know that's not true. And data can be very problematic, but it's not just data. It can be, you know, in the design, the whole thing could be off, right? The whole thing could be uh, unethical and have roots in unethical approaches. Um, certainly the data set construction um, can, be, can be a problem. There's an example from Amazon so they had trained a model <laughs> that they wanted to have a model that would sift through um, CVs that were coming in and only select the ones that were most likely to get the job. You know, and so what they did was they trained the model on successful CVs, which is fine, except everyone who had been hired, every successful CV happened to be a man. So. If they had implemented, which they didn't, then they actually like shut down, <laughs> I think that whole unit. Uh, if they had implemented that model, again, implementation of the prediction, there would be a problem because they're not gonna get any women because the model had learned to reject anything that seemed like not a male. So if you had anything, like I went to a women's college, you, you were read out, right? So. You don't know what it will learn, but you also have a responsibility to understand what um, what you're going to do with that model afterwards, right? Don't use it. So um, we don't have time to go over this today, but I, I like this one because it, this is an activity that we do in the wider workshop. And this is about um, looking at the data again. So um the Google had trained a model based on images. Um, and when they went to use the model to, to describe images, it had this, you know, really nice kind of rich metadata for the first three that it was a wedding, but it certainly didn't for the last one, which also is a wedding. So if they'd had a more culturally diverse um, group of people doing annotation, if they had more culturally diverse data, so more images balanced with the other ones, this wouldn't have been a problem. So then they did do um, a major project to rectify that situation and get more diverse imagery um, from across the world. So there's a couple more minutes, I promise I'll give people time to ask questions, but, um, kind of leading on from that. So how can GLAM staff help manage bias in machine learning approaches? So you might be surprised to know that you don't have to be a data scientist or even working with machine learning to have some impact in this area, right? So um, hiring, so ensuring that we have a diverse workforce, um, that's an imperative. I recommend, of course, leading responsible operations, um, which gives lots and lots of tips in this area. Um, when you're collecting and annotating data, make sure you have diversified crowds for the task um, and enlist help of staff with the right domain expertise to review data construction before and after, right? So they might see things in the, in the um, data that you wouldn't, right? Um, and also here's something that we can all do, contribute our diverse language materials and collections and texts to sources where model builders are finding their data. So things like Wikipedia, right? Contribute yourself. If you, you know, you're, 
if you are from a diverse background, um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't hear it like a white male, but Wikipedia is predominantly white male men who are, you know, though there is a sort of rules about um, contributing to Wiki Wikipedia to make it more balanced. The fact of the matter is it is coming from a certain worldview, right? W wrong or right, but it is. Um, so having more diverse activity in areas of the internet, um, having more diverse photography and images shared on Wikimedia Commons out in the world to be sucked up by these models um, will help to balance things out. Um, and also look for machine learning projects that might help um, even the playing field. So we did one on, you know, this Arabic HTR, which I kind of showed you is a, a sort of example of that, right? So all of the available kind of OCR tools out there had been very much focused on English language materials. We actually were approved by people wanting to work with Arabic, um, build Arabic uh, automatic transcription models, and they were like, we can't find enough handwritten Arabic stuff. And we were like, we've got a ton of it. Yeah, here you go. So that's the sort of opportunities you might see. Um, and then thinking about your partnership, know your data. So as a cataloger, if you guys are making data sets, let people know the weird nuances that might be in the catalog records, right? So you as a cataloger have this experience of this data. Um, and you can use things like data sheets and model cards, that sort of thing, to um, let people know who are going to use your cultural heritage data what they might expect, what could possibly be in there and that would be a model model <laughs> for the use of a model. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of planning resources and best practices. Um, so AI Assurance has just come out from the government. Library of Congress has an AI planning framework. Um, this DOI is from my pal at the Smithsonian. So they've written about, you know, what they're doing in AI. Um, and I'm sure if you have more resources, please put them in the, the chat and I can always include that um, later. But yeah, so that was it. I hope that that was... <laughs> Helpful to you guys. I'll stop sharing now. Um, it was a whirlwind, but I did my best. <laughs> Thank you very much, and yet yeah, Thank you to everyone who's been putting messages in the chat. And we've had a couple of questions in, but please do add questions if you have been thinking of something. And if there's something in the chat you want to ask, please pop that over into the Q&A. So um, first one is saying, thank you very much for your fantastic presentation. But also, do you know of any AI solutions for generating metadata, e.g. to categorize web pages for web archiving? Oh, interesting. So I don't off the top of my head, but I'm certain that there will be um, experiments in that. So I would have to take that back to um, my colleagues and colleagues in the web archive. So I'm not in that kind of area of web archiving, but I'm certain that they're they're well on their way exploring Thank those you. things. So hopefully yeah. there's a way that I could, you know, if I don't have the answer here, because it's such a wide thing, um, that I might be able to send, or people can get in touch with me as well. Feel free to email me anytime and I can send your questions or take some time with them and um, uh, respond. Thank you. And for everybody's um, knowledge, the last session of this series will be a cafe star, which will be open for questions and discussions. So, and that will be, I think, 10th of July. So yeah, um, if, you, if you've got answers to these questions or there's something you'd like to discuss that you think of later on, please feel free to come along to that session. Another question, could we use um, HR, HTR, sorry, handwriting, handwritten text recognition, I'm always tripping over my words, to read scrolls, damage archival materials? Yes. So there are some really, so if you look in the digital humanities has quite a few um, examples of this. And like anything, it would be a, a lot of different technologies would be involved in that. So in the imaging, some scrolls can't even be um, unwound, right? So there will be lots of steps. So that would just be one part of it. Um, 
but a lot of imaging, computer vision to kind of predict, you know, wh where the text is on the page that is like kind of bent. So yeah. there would be a lot of technologies involved in that. Um, and you could probably get, so I was going to say my little spiel, and I, probably you'll have to cut this. <laughs> uh, but if you can like mention these in funding proposals, you'll get a lot of money <laughs> to do things that you want to get done. Right. So even just like your classic, we need money to catalog something. But if you add in like this will be a good data set for machine learning as well, you're going to get your catalog money, you know, cataloging money. Extra for that. So something like that, that project would be wonderful if you just scroll in, in that realm. So, again, um, I do have examples just not off the top of my head. I'm picturing it right now. So if you want to just write me at visual research, I'm happy to. Um, hunt down those those examples as a start for you. Thank you. And then another one, what were the results of your fiction, nonfiction accuracy projects? How so I I can't remember. So on the blog, they have it all written out and they were very happy with them. Um, I should have written it down, but it was something like the probability was hovering around something like 90% for a majority of the things, right? But here's another thing that happens at institutions that you have to keep in mind. Um, when I showed you that kind of thing about projects and the whole like looking at the stages of projects and how things can go back and forth, you might like just go full steam ahead on something. So this kind of happened with the the language ones that we did. Um, and you as the data scientist might be like, I'm so excited that the probability that this is right for this amount of the text, um, that looks good to me. I'm okay if we put those in the catalog. And then you talk to the, you talk <laughs> too late <laughs> to the metadata department and they're like, absolutely not. We will only be happy with it if it's a hundred percent. That changes the whole project. So you really have to think about when you are embarking on a machine learning project, it's okay to experiment, but um, if you want the results to be well received, get the right people in the room straight away, right? So you don't have that kind of shock and awe and surprise at the end. So you're all agreeing, like, what does success look like? What are we going to be, you know, happy about? That would be yeah. good. And how do people still get involved in that? It's assistive, isn't it? It's assisting us to do these things. It doesn't necessarily mean that we won't need people involved in some of those stages to... Not well, so, I mean, sometimes, you know, when you think of like using machine learning as a tool, if you do the simple math of how long it would take to detect language in 250,000 books... <laughs> For, is a curator's time well spent <laughs> trying to over 30 years <laughs> looking at every book and trying to get language, you know, identification. These these tools are meant to be, be useful to us, to free us up to do the stuff that, that we want to do. The curators want to have language materials labeled, right? They don't want to sit around and open every book and say, this book is has Spanish in it. And also, you know, the models can do much more that, than we could do. So it might have small bits of French in a book, right? It might have a French poem in a Spanish book. So how you miss that, right? A human could miss that. The algorithm may find that. So there's these kinds of like cost benefits for some of that, that work. Um, and so I think it's more about education. So this is what we try to do through our digital scholarship training program. So make curators kind of interested and want, not just, I'm saying curators, but I just staff, you know, yeah. it's an old school mm -hmm. thing of mine. But, you know, it's anyone, anyone, make people interested and understand that they are empowered when they hear about these projects to get involved. And also to let the data scientists know, you know, if they're not aware, typically they are in cultural heritage, but, um, you know, you got to run this by, by this group straight away. They need to know what you're doing, you know, and, and allow that group 
to not see machine learning as a threat, but a tool. And so there's education on both sides. And, and as digital curators, we're really lucky at the British Library because that is our job. We're kind of sat in the middle as the communicators um, between different, you know, very techie people, collections people, who more and more are quite techie as well, um, and making those kind of, make sh making sure that communication is happening. And I think, lastly, you were talking about the library carpentries that you've developed. Yes. Are there, are there, if people are going away going, oh, I really want to give it a try and I want to find out more, what are the things that you found useful um, to where to start and sort of... Well, if you can wait a little bit, a couple of months. So I'm part of um, Lever, which is the research libraries group um, in the UK. And... One of the things I'm trying to do, and we are working at right now through some writing sprints, is create topic guides on all this stuff. So um, we have a lot of knowledge, a lot of you know links to case studies, and we're launching that in July with the first kind of set of topic guides. And they will point you to tutorials and things, um, case studies that you can go off and do um, on your own, but also, you know, on all these kinds of topics and also um, uh, get kind of recommendations, reading, this sort of stuff and make it easier for people to like quickly in a one pager. These are like short topic guides, um, but meant to get you quickly on the path of like, yes, here are really good courses you could try, you could go off and try. Okay, so we got Five minutes. I'm just going to do one last question before you all go and run to your last meeting. Um, so do you have any views on the usefulness of developing SML as opposed to LLML for more focused subject specific purposes? Yeah. So, I mean, there is always this kind of balance, right? So um, when we did. Um, so when you think of like Google's big models, right? So these are like generalized models. And sometimes they they actually will not do as well for particular bits of content. So there's still an opportunity for developing things on a smaller basis that are more bespoke, that involve, you know, when we're talking about choosing the model, yeah. right? Some will not not work as well. The results will not be as good unless you are working at a scale and a specificity um, of a particular content, right? So yeah, I mean, it's all part of the process is evaluating how these models work for you that are out there. Um, what are the tools? You know, a lot of people will, will choose an LLM and, and they don't even need that, you know? So it's it's all part of the process.